Should we go to uh, Ed's piece now? Yeah, let's go to Ed's piece because I think this starts to break down um, some more of the dynamics here. So this is a piece by the always great friend of the show, Edward Angueso, um, in Motherboard. The crypto crash just got a lot worse. Investors are panicking. Um, and he basically breaks down what happened at Celsius. But I want to go to the section here because it really highlights um, some of the fundamental problems of this entire industry. Celsius is a lending firm that works similarly to banks, but with much higher risk since deposits are not federally insured. The platform lets you deposit crypto in exchange for abnormally high interest rates up to 18%. A savings account typically nets 1% to 2%. To pay out such high rates, Celsius takes deposits and either invests them or lends them out to traders and charges a high rate for the loan. Celsius advertises that 1.7 million people have deposited with the service. Um, and you know, one of the things to note here is that Celsius, when things got bad, they shut down their system, meaning that you couldn't withdraw money from the system, creating a lot of crisis and obviously, you know, kind of psychological fear for people, only encouraging more and more people to pull their money out of crypto. Um, but the, the most important note to make here is that some of the worst stuff that we've seen with crypto on top of, you know, the way that has been marketing to people who don't have the capacity or the capability really to be invested in these kind of risky assets is the way that a lot of these companies are trying to step in and act like banks that are either federally insured or certainly federally regulated um, in ways that they haven't been regulated and they're certainly not insured today, meaning that people have assets that can just go poof like that overnight. Right. And that's extremely, extremely dangerous um, in any circumstance, but certainly for the people who are advocating that this is some kind of alternative model to finance. Right. Um, that the lessons that we learned, for example, in this country, in the Great Depression and almost every financial crisis that we've had, is that it's very important to have safeguards so that the, the constant boom and bust cycle of capitalism doesn't always fall into complete catastrophe for normal everyday people, because the people at the top, they get taken care of. Right. They get looked after. They get protected. It's people like you and me um, who get really, really screwed over by this. And the fact that these organizations were even allowed in the first place to be acting in this way is a real, real failure of our federal regulators here. Um, and two, it's just like a, a completely explodes the whole libertarian fantasy that this is something different. This is the only difference here is that people were able to carve out a new space where there weren't these kind of protections and regulations for normal people in them. That is the innovation here, not the blockchain, not the technology, none of that. It's that there are no regulations. So they were able to do this kind of extremely risky thing with other people's money. Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing with uh, Peter Thiel and Blake Masters zero to one, which mm -hmm. is you find and you see this with Uber and stuff like that, right? You find an industry whose uh, sort of brutal exploitation has been lessened over the years through regulation and you avoid that regulation because tech, woo, mm -hmm. we're not yeah. a bank, we're a tech firm. We're not a, a, a cab firm. We're a tech firm. We're not a this. Mm -hmm. We're a tech firm. And you can avoid all those regulations. It's fucking, that's the innovation. That's all the fucking innovation you've seen in this country is regulatory avoidance <laughs> yes. uh, because, uh, because the fucking internet exists now. Uh, it, it's really, it's really shabby, I think. So let's go to um, El Salvador here because uh, one of the things that I think has always really infuriated me about this entire trend has been the way um that poor countries have been sort of targeted by this from Bitcoin magazine saying that Palestinians uh, need Bitcoin um, as a way to avoid apartheid. No, they need to end the occupation there to help Palestinian people. And there's a lot of arguments, too, as to why it doesn't really make a lot of sense um, for people in that part of the world. Um, to be relying on an extremely, extremely risky asset like Bitcoin, especially in places where you don't always have access um, to the Internet. Um, but we're going to go to El Salvador, um, where Bukele, who is somebody who has one, I think just has to be noted up top. And we're going to go to a story about him in, in just a moment. You know, on top of the Bitcoin stuff, which I think he's become sort of famous for in this country, um, is an, a very, very cruel and horrific authoritarian leader and should be opposed just on that level. And sometimes I think the Bitcoin stuff overshadows that um, for people. But remember, they made Bitcoin legal currency, legal tender in El Salvador, and it has been an absolute disaster. So this is crypto, um, the crypto desk at Bloomberg. Uh, they went and they sent somebody down there. This is, I believe, June 5th, so very recent, to go and see how this rollout has been for everyday people. 
But the rollout hasn't been entirely smooth. Most businesses are struggling to adapt and say that Chivo is often slow and clunky. Bitcoin's volatile price swings have also scared many away from using it. During a recent visit to El Salvador, some Bitcoin transactions took longer than a day to be fully approved, and the fees were quite high. Taxi drivers, watch repairmen, and other small businesses said they still prefer to be paid in dollars. Just to uh, tell folks what she said there, she said, uh, why not, you know, we have that service here, but why not, why won't I accept that? Because those of us who don't know how to read uh, will lose money. Yeah. Um, we can play a little bit more if we want to finish. Yeah, I mean, it's it, that's the end. I mean, it's just other people saying similar things, right? And I mean, this is this is the note here, right? Is that despite, you know, it's one of the points that we've been making, not only about Bitcoin and crypto, but also technology in general. Like, we're, uh, you know, I'll speak for myself, but I'm not anti-technology, but I'm against this kind of technology ideology, right? Where people think that something new is just on the merit of it being new, shiny, and different is going to be able to solve problems when a lot of the problems that we face right now are actually very, very clear um, where 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 the problem uh, begins. And the problem in countries like El Salvador is hyper-exploitation um, from the global north and mass poverty that is continued through people like Bukele, who is trying to create, you know, a class system there. When he's talking, uh, when he, you know, makes his triumphant um statements and you know he was out the other day saying oh it's time to buy more bitcoin and you're seeing huge losses for the country's treasury which is extremely damaging in a country like el salvador though it would be in any country if you were like fuck could you imagine if we were just like losing part of the federal budget because biden <laughs> had like invested it in cryptocurrency to the but, moon, you know, man yeah i mean you wouldn't accept that because you, you you can't run a functional system on an asset as volatile um, as, as Bitcoin or one where the technology just doesn't work, as they were saying there, where transactions are taking over a day uh, to complete. And it should be noted, too, that Celsius, um, one of the, the excuses that they made was a transaction was basically taking too long to process and holding up the, the entire system. Right, so this is something that just could not build out functionally um, as, as currency. And it never has been currency. It's always been an asset. That's always been a BS claim. Um, and for things... what? For what? Like, why are you mm. waiting longer to do technology magic? What the fuck? Like, I know. like <laughs> it's. I mean, it's it's despicable and it, and it's disgusting. And again, like this kind of ideology, like, oh, we're going to give people this new technology and that's going to solve the the problems. There's like, no, th these problems are very very simple. We've known them for a long time. It's capitalism, France. Yeah. Um, and let's let's go here on uh, on uh, because we're going to come back to. Um, the Federal Reserve in a second, because that's where a lot of these uh, critics, the, the Bitcoin people are going to start going. Um, but I want to start here because it has to be noted. Um, this is a, a piece in The Guardian. Um, El Salvador accused of massive human rights violations with 2%, 2% of adults in prison. More than 36,000 people arrested in over two months and crackdown orchestrated by President Nayib Bukele. Um, if you go to the next one here. Amnesty International has accused El Salvador's government of committing massive human rights violations during an extraordinary security crackdown that has seen more than 36,000 people arrested in just over two months. The clampdown was orchestrated by the Central American country's authoritarian minded president, Bukele, in late March after a sudden eruption of bloodshed that saw 87 murders in a sing single weekend. Um, Bukele's response to those killings was swift and severe, with pro-government lawmakers approving a draconian state of exception, which entered into his third month last week. This week, Bukele's security minister, Gustavo Villatoro, claimed 36,000 people have been detained since their war on gangs began. 31,000 men and 5,114 women, right? There's just no question here um, that like this is just 
basic law stuff that you can't just do these kind of mass arrests and detention because more often than not you're going to be pulling in people who are completely innocent and even for people who are guilty of of crimes you're completely ignoring their basic rights to due process and a fair and just legal system and it just has i just want to note that up here when we're talking about el salvador because i think it's important for people to also remember the package that this kind of bitcoin shit comes in right it is these kind of anti-democratic authoritarian fig figures from people like Bukele, who leads a country to these kind of right wing libertarian organizations here in this country um, as, as well. Yeah, I mean, that th that, that is a lot of uh, arrests and like what what is his. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. We should, we and he's get been, a guest on he's that. been targeting the left. He's been targeting indigenous groups. We'll do more on this in the future, yeah. but I, I want to make sure that we talked about that here. Yep. But to end this, let's talk about the moment that we're we can pull this out for a second, Matt. Um, to end this, uh, I want to talk about the moment that we're in. And you, this all stems the, the crypto wave, right? The excitement around it, the money that's been pumped into it has happened in a very peculiar dynamic in American capitalism in particular. It has happened in an era of extremely cheap money, but not only have the interest rates been low, the Federal Reserve has been playing a huge role, role in booing up the economy. And there's no doubt that there's a connection between the incredible rise of things like Bitcoin to the incredible rise of tech stocks. We note Tesla all the time on this program. Tesla, a car company that doesn't really produce cars in the first place, being you know overvalued for a time, uh, not overvalued for a time, valued more for a time um, than car companies that produce more in a month than Tesla does in a year, right? And that kind of stuff happens when you have mass speculation. And that is the kind of stuff that happens when you have free-flowing easy money. But as we've seen from the Federal Reserve, we talked about last week how Powell has said his goal is not to come for the bottom lines of these super rich people. It's to make life extremely difficult for poor and working class people and to target wages with the hope that wages will go down so you have a more servile and less um, rebellious workforce in this country. Remember when the Volcker shock happened in this country, it set this country in the 70s, right? It set this country down a trajectory that we're still in today, where wages have never recovered that harsh austerity that was imposed by the, the Federal Reserve. And it always has to be noted, in addition um, to what happened domestically in the United States, the, the Volcker program created mass crises across the developing world and created a debt crisis in Central America and South America. And guess who comes in to save the day? the IMF, World Bank. And what does that come with? All these stipulations about how you have to run your country, all these stipulations, uh, um, all of these basically forced austerity programs on other nations, right? These have always been attacks on growing power for the left, for workers, and for independent countries. And as we're starting to see the Federal Reserve start to you know, roll back a lot of these things, pay attention to the effects in the rest of the world. So a lot of people are talking about the rate increases um, that we have, uh, that, that we're seeing. They, they're going to increase interest rates, which is going to have extreme knockdown effects for all of us. Um, but it also has to be noted that the Federal Reserve is trimming its $9 trillion balance sheet. And that has been absolutely critical for keeping the economy afloat during the slowdown from COVID and after the financial crisis. Um, and it's certainly also responsible for the frothy nature of speculation because these things aren't just dials. You know, you move the dial one way to the right and the economy gets good. You move it a little bit to the left. It gets worse. Right. These things have knockdown effects and they don't hit everybody equally. So during this period of like very cheap money, the Federal Reserve basically stabilizing prices for assets, it meant that people who are in that class, asset holders, people who have relationships with banks, people who have lines of credit, it got really, really easy for them um, to pursue highly speculative, risky activities. Now, for the rest of us, very, very little positive has come, but it prevented a complete falling out of the system, which would be devastating for everybody, right? And now we're seeing the Federal Reserve, um, which has been playing a very, very active role in the treasury market. Um, you know, it's been stabilizing prices. But now because um, it's, sta it's scaling back those activities, it's creating crisis. And the real crisis that we could see is if the Federal Reserve 
pulls out too much money out of the system. And if you could put up this last bit up here, Matt, this is from the Federal, I'm um, sorry, Financial Times. I think it just breaks it down very well. When the Fed buys bonds, it electronically credits the seller and turning adding reserves to the banking system that then enable banks to increase their lending to individuals and companies. By ceasing to reinvest the proceeds of its bond portfolio, the process reverses, leading to fewer reserves in the system and tighter financial conditions. And what does that mean for everybody else? It means that corporations are going to face squeeze, a squeeze. And what do corporations do first? Do they cut the CEO's salary? Um, did they cut back the waste that is going on in the company? No, they target workers. And workers are going to be the ones who are going to face the brunt of this kind of restructuring of the economy. Workers are going to be the first ones who are hit. Um, and it should be noted, again, the Federal Reserve did historic stuff during the COVID-19 pandemic. From buying corporate debt to its role in the uh, um, in the treasuries market, historic intervention from the Federal Reserve. But again, what class of people did that benefit? It benefited the rich and the powerful in the society. That money wasn't coming to you or me, right? And now what the Federal Reserve is doing is creating a system where the punishment is going to fall on the backs of workers in this country and workers all around the world. So when you hear the Bitcoin bros, uh, I don't know what I'll call them, the Bitcoin boys, right? Um, you know, complaining about the Federal Reserve, because they are, they already are, right? There's two things to note. One, I thought y'all had an independent financial system that wasn't <laughs> attached to the, the real economy. Um, but the most important one is to, um, is to note that, no, y'all got into the situation because of Federal Reserve policy that was benefiting a specific class. And yes, what the Federal Reserve is doing right now is absolutely devastating. But what the real devastation is, is what it's going to be doing to workers, not what it's doing to little freaks who are trying to bamboozle people and trying to trick people so yeah. that you could make a bag while the rest of us suffer. Absolutely. Well, we got, um, I'm sure we'll have to do a lot more on that. It's tough because like, you know, every like bit of me wants to just do this big victory lap, but it's, it's, I can't do it because it's painful to see, um, you know, some of the reactions from people who have been roped into this scam. It's painful to see some of the, the real trick or trickle down effects of people like those, those sellers, um, in El Salvador. And it's going to be really, really devastating, um, as Americans are setting themselves, uh, are, are having to prepare themselves for what looks like a, a very, very serious, uh, blow of austerity, um, coming from the federal reserves, uh, policies here. So there's going to be, yeah, it's just, it's just tough to be like gleeful, um, that we were right about this. It's funny. Um, like we can't be gleeful about it being right about everything about it. Uh, we can't also like just leave it alone like we've wanted to because more and more people that are high and higher uh, prominence are take Chris and Gillibrand and fucking Loomis from uh, Wyoming got together, did a bipartisan bill, basically giving crypto everything it wants mm -hmm. um, for security. So you can trade this absolute bullshit securely and blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, that's just another uh, version of that. So yeah, like we're, it's, it's here to stay, I think, until until it goes kaplunk for good, which I mean, it's gonna be a wild day.